When you listen to classical music, it's common to hear a symphony of brass, woodwinds, and percussion layered on top of one another. But even though these instruments are producing overlapping sounds, you can tell them all apart. You can distinguish them because they each have a unique tone, which musicians call their timbre. Timbre isn't some mysterious qualitative property, though. In fact, mathematicians have created a tool called the Fourier transform that we can use to visualize why instruments sound different. Despite its scary name, how Fourier transforms work is pretty simple, and its applications are widespread. So today, we'll be talking through the simple version. In my last video, we discussed how an infinite sum of waves can approximate the shape of any function. The Fourier transform unpacks each constituent wave and plots its amplitude as a function of frequency. If we have a function made up of five waves, then the Fourier transform would have five corresponding peaks. From left to right, the frequencies increase from their lowest to their highest, and the taller the peak, the larger the amplitude of the corresponding wave. But when we take the Fourier transform of more complicated functions, these graphs can reveal hidden properties of the original waveform. Imagine individually recording several instruments playing the same note and taking the Fourier transform of each of their sounds. You would find a series of sharp peaks at identical frequencies, but the heights of these peaks would vary between instruments. These regular peaks, called harmonics, appear at multiples of the original note's frequency. The difference in each harmonic strength makes a trumpet sound different from a flute and my voice sound different from yours. It's important to note that we can convert back and forth from the Fourier transform of an audio to the original audio itself. We can do this because the combination of waves that make up a waveform are unique, so no two functions would produce the same Fourier transform. But what happens if we alter the Fourier transform before converting it back into a waveform? The phrase signal processing commonly describes manipulating a Fourier transform to change the corresponding signal. This definition is a little vague, so let's unpack what it means. It's often helpful to think of Fourier transforms in terms of frequency ranges. In general, waves with a lower frequency influence the overall shape of a signal, whereas those with a higher frequency fill in the finer details. If we want to recreate the sound of a flute, Lower frequency waves will produce the raw pitch, and higher frequency ones will create the airy quality we associate with the instrument. Signal processors might use this information to extract pitch data from music, or even create synthetic instruments by manipulating the strength of each harmonic. As it turns out, we can also calculate the Fourier transform of images. Rather than producing typical plots with peaks, these Fourier transforms are two-dimensional. Values closer to the center represent lower frequency waves, and those further from the center represent higher frequency waves. If you had to guess, what would happen if we deleted the data for the high frequency waves that make up an image? The image would become blurrier since we've removed data for the finer details. If we restored the high frequency waves, what would happen if we deleted the low frequency ones? We would only be left with the fine details, meaning that places where the color quickly changes would pop out. This method of image manipulation can sharpen pictures, reconstruct corrupted images, and even develop training data for artificial intelligence. Now that we have some intuition about Fourier transforms and signal processing, let's see how we can use them in the real world. When you record audio onto your computer, it's common to capture unwanted background noise. Sometimes these noises are one-off occurrences, like a text notification. In those cases, you'll probably need to re-record the audio. But sometimes, there is also an ambient amount of noise caused by the properties of the room you're recording in. For example, a ceiling fan might cause air to swirl around your room and into your mic, making the audio sound airy. But since this unwanted noise typically has a consistent strength and sound, we can isolate it using Fourier transforms. We do this by recording the noise profile of your room, which is the Fourier transform of whatever your microphone passively picks up. You can then subtract this noise profile from your original recording to reduce or even eliminate noise in your audio. Musicians rarely stop at this step though. Sometimes they want the bass or vocals of their recording to pop. Changing the balance of sounds in audio is called mixing, and it's done by altering Fourier transform data. Remember that lower frequencies produce lower notes and higher frequencies produce higher notes. So to bass boost our audio, we might increase the strength of low frequencies. 
Note that we have to be careful about how we apply these transformations. Making too large of an adjustment to the wave strength can cause undesired audio artifacts, such as clipping, detuning, and even the distortion of instruments or vocals. Unfortunately, keeping track of data for tens of thousands of waves makes raw song files fairly large. This problem is even worse for videos and images, so how do we still send and store so many of these files on our phones? Using a process called data compression, we can reduce the space required to store any media type. Sometimes this is done using clever tricks that retain the original file's quality. But if we're willing to lose some detail, we can use Fourier transforms for a special kind of data compression. Often, it's not necessary to exactly recreate all of the signal's details. We can get away with this because our senses are only sensitive to a certain threshold, so it's often useless to hold on to data that we can't observe. In audio, this type of compression is a simple process. We take the Fourier transform of some audio, and if a peak's amplitude is less than some arbitrary threshold, we delete it. This technique is commonplace among music streaming services since retaining the original quality of every song would be impractical. Additionally, if you've ever saved audio as an mp3 file, you've performed this exact process. Since mp3 files delete low amplitude waves, it is considered a lossy form of data compression. JPEGs, a type of image file, also employ lossy data compression. Every time an image is saved as a JPEG, it deletes the low amplitude wave data in that image. This is why saving an image as a JPEG several times can cause its quality to degrade. Even though losing some of the original detail of your data can be frustrating, compression is quick and efficient, making storing and streaming content much more feasible. Today, we've only discussed a small number of examples to develop an intuition for how Fourier transforms work. But in researching for this video, there was no end to the number of applications I found. To demonstrate this one tool's versatility, let me list some additional examples. In at least some way, Fourier transforms are used in EEG analysis, heart rate variability, MRIs, DNA sequencing, radio astronomy, digital oscilloscopes, music information retrieval, antenna design, video compression, musical instrument tuning, seismic data processing, speech synthesis, computer vision, speech recognition, quantum mechanics, geolocation and positioning, audio equalization, industrial fault detection, and sonar. This list is far from exhaustive, but it should communicate this one tool's importance in our daily lives. Science isn't always about collecting new data. We often have everything we need to understand the intricacies of our universe, but we lack an understanding of the mechanics at play. Fourier transforms don't present us with new data, they just frame information in a new way and this reframing has allowed us to make technological developments we couldn't have imagined a couple hundred years ago. So the next time you find yourself stuck on a problem, try approaching it from a new angle. And until next time, thank you for watching.